I was uh, drafted when I was 18 years old. And when the war broke out, I was 41 as far as we were concerned. And uh, I said to Dad right away, as soon as I get 18, I want to enlist. And he said, no, don't enlist, because he had grown up in World War I. So uh, I waited till I was 18, and they drafted me, so I was tickled to death. I really wanted to go. Uh, I thought it was interesting. You know, back in them days, as we grew up, we played with soldiers, <laughs> Indians and cowboys. And uh, to me, it was good. So I got drafted with no problem, and I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And the next day, I found myself on a train going to Mississippi, Camp McCain, Mississippi. And uh, there I was in the uh, 167th Engineers. That's what I was originally drafted into. And I was in there with basic training, took all the uh, different things and uh, building bridges and all that stuff. So after a while I was in there, I said to myself, I'm, I'm not satisfied where I'm at. Putting bridges up, Tearing them down wasn't what I thought I got drafted for. So I got my chance to go down and enlist in the Airborne. So you have to volunteer for the Airborne. So I went down, took the test, passed it, and I always got a big joke out of the guy. He says, you know, I'm a little worried about you, son. I said, what's that? He said, well, you only weigh 135 pounds. So when you jump out, I'm afraid you're going to go up instead of come down. But it was just a joke, and uh, I got in the airborne, transferred, and uh, boy, the training they put us through. I mean, I was in the service for a little while and been taking exercise and all, but boy, they put you through the mill. And we had two weeks of solid exercise. And uh, when we got done that, we'd go over there to the PX at night to get something to eat or drink. And boy, you had to lift one leg up after another. You couldn't even hardly move. And a couple of weeks, you were in good shape. And boy, you felt good. So then they took us down and showed us how to pack parachutes and showed us how to do that for about two weeks. And they come around the next time and said, now you, this is the parachute you're going to jump, so make sure you're doing the job right. Well, we used to get on the PX at night and we'd joke with each other. Hey, you, boy, you got here quick tonight. You sure you packed that thing right? You know, just the needle of the guys. I don't know. You know, I think you must be built a certain way. It's just like the, since the war ended. I mean, I had my buddies die. I've seen a lot of action. But it, it don't affect me like it does most people. I keep a positive attitude. I don't live in the past. I remember the past. Now, I can sit here and tell you from day one, well, my life was white, and I just praise the Lord for that because I can remember that good. But I don't harp on it. In other words, I'm living for today. This is another day with me, and I live that way. And uh, if you let yourself get down, you ain't going to come back up, and I don't like that. I enjoyed every moment I was in the service. It didn't matter how rough it was, I enjoyed it. To me, the service is great. In fact, I'm a type of guy that would say they should have never ended the draft. Everybody 18 ought to go in for two years. I think it does you a world of good. Now today, I don't know anything about the service. I'm only talking from the time when I was in. That's what I got out of it. It, it gave you values. And I know people that said, well, they, they went to Canada during World War II. Hey, I don't want them in my outfit anyhow. I want guys like I had, a crew that was dedicated, watch each other's back, and enjoy what we had. Uh, we were down in Charlotte, North Carolina. When we went into that town, we had our wings and we had our boots. And we had 100 bucks a month in our pocket. And to me, I was proud of being where I was at. I told them before in the interview, the Air Corps thought they owned Charlotte, North Carolina. They didn't. The paratroopers owned it. We had a ball. So as far as me sacrificing anything, I think I got a lot more out of serving than most people probably got. When we went into Holland, come out of Holland, 
and we didn't have those two missions, and we were in Paris having a good time when the breakthrough come through. And I met guys that were on the front lines when they were on breakthrough. And I mean, it was, it was murder. In fact, I think, I'm not mistaken, they took 200 prisoners, lined them up and shot them like that, about that time. And, uh, but uh, we went up there, they run us out of Paris, picked us up in Paris, gave us our guns, gave us one clip of ammunition and four hand grenades, put us on the truck, we drove up the Bastogne, dumped us off, and the trucks took off, and the next <laughs> half hour we were surrounded. So they didn't get the, they got supplies in when the weather broke, but the weather was bad. It snowed. And we were on a, uh, when we first went in, there was a small house there, had an old man, an old lady, and a girl 18 years old. And they lived in there. Well, that was our outpost. So what we did, there was three of us in there, and we put mines, we had mines all tied together, tank mines. And what we were supposed to do, if the Germans started to come up the road, we were to run across the road with these mines. And we could never figure out why couldn't we put that rope around a tree and pull them mines over, but they told us we had to run across the road with the mines. Thank goodness we never had to do it. But uh, in that house was an outpost. And uh, so that's where we stayed and watched the Germans were eh, half a mile or so down the road. And this squad would come down from Bastogne. Uh, they had a squad with a guy with a BAR walking down the middle. And the first time he come down, he said, now whatever you guys do, don't click the safety on your gun because you're gonna be dead. So they come up and down the road at night. We stand guard out there. We take one guy and the other guy. And uh, they come up and down the road. So after a while, they come down and told us we have to move in. Pick us up and take us in. Well, it was funny. Uh, my buddy, he had a bazooka. It wouldn't be funny to a lot of people, but he had a bazooka and I had the ammunition. We carried that, I carried that ammunition all the way back towards Bastogne. And when we got back here, we had to dig foxholes and all. And I said, where's the bazooka? He said, swaying up against that house down there. I ain't carrying that thing no more, it's too heavy. So if that had been the day's army, he probably got locked up. But uh, so I, I said, man, I'm carrying the ammunition and you left the bazooka. Well, you know how it goes. And to me, even, I can remember everything. I can see them bullets from them 50 caliber bullets coming over our head. On Christmas morning, they asked us, they were going down, that tank was down there. So they sent two guys down with a bazooka and they asked for volunteers. My buddy and I, we got on a machine gun. We had three machine guns lined up and I was feeding it and he was going to shoot. Well, as soon as they shot that bazooka off, I never had any faith in them things. It bounced off. So as soon as it bounced off, the Germans in the tank knew they'd been hit. So the tank turret moved around, and 50 cowers come right over our head. I mean, that's the first time I've seen 50s that close. And we opened up with the machine guns to cover the guys as they come back, and which wasn't too smart uh, because the machine gun bullets got tracers in them. So as soon as the tracers went down towards the tank, them guys could see where we were at. So the next shell come in, the shell went over the head and the guys in back took a beating. But when that shell went off, the machine guns were gone. <laughs> and I was laying on my back. I didn't even know I was hit. The medic was on top of me, patching me up. But even in that time, we never got to where we were scared or nothing. I don't know what you would actually tell people. You know, not, I mean, these people, like, there was people that were in a lot more combat than I was in, naturally. But uh, we never had no trouble with it. I mean, I come out of service, got discharged December 8th, got married January 12th, and went back to work. Been working ever since ever, until I retired. I never had no problem with it. 
And I think it's very important for people to understand about the veterans and what they sacrifice. But, you know, if you've never been there, you don't know. I mean, you can watch videos, you can watch tapes. And if you go up to the Walmart today, how many people are really interested in what's going on with, as far as the war? Now, this war, let me see, I got my own opinions. World War II was a good war, if you want to call it a good war. We accomplished something. This stuff today is going to last for years because I don't believe we should put a man on the ground unless we're going to take that place, just like we did at Normandy. We went from Normandy right into Germany, and the war ended. But today, you're playing, for, I'll tell you, I wouldn't like this war. I mean, we had a war where we knew what we were doing. But for you to come in and tell me that here I am in the camp tonight, and I'm going out on the same route tomorrow as I went out yesterday, and those guys got all night to set out booby traps. Yo, know, I want to take them people out one time and that's it, and get out of there. That's my version. I believe you go in there and get the discipline. I don't know how the service is today. First of all, we didn't have women in combat roles. We had them waves and, and stuff like that. And uh, we didn't have them in the flying, they were flying airplanes, they tell me, the end ferrying planes. But we didn't have women with us. And I certainly, not to be prejudiced, I would not want a woman alongside of me in, where I'm at. That's a horrible place to be. That's a horrible place to be. I mean, when you see, the first guy I seen when we went into Holland, I didn't see the whole guy. He was just part of him lying there. And that was the first taste of what I seen. And I thought, well, this is what it's all about. And I wouldn't, to me, I got an awful lot of respect for women. And boy, to put them in something like that, Believe it or not, since I've been wearing this hat, I've had a lot of people come up and shake hands with me. People all over, Walmart, Burger King, not just once in a while a guy will buy me my, my lunch, but I mean women, young fellows, all come up, thanks for your service. Now that makes me feel good when they do that. Every day is Veterans Day. Every day is Secretary's Day. That's the way I look at it. To me, it's the greatest country in the world. <laughs> I mean, you, there's a lot of wrong things about it, but to me, it's the greatest country in the world and always will be. If you've been in it and you see the American flag go by, man, you got to salute that flag. That, you peel it in here, man. That's right there.